I want to caveat this video by saying I don't hate Mikhail, and I'm not one of those fans calling for his head. I think he should be given credit for the job he's done with this team. Sure, some may say that it's not really Mikhail, it's just that the Rockets have a talented group of guys. There's truth to that. The Rockets are loaded with talent, but if you notice, they tend to do better after they've had days to practice. Now, it may just be because of the rest or whatever, but I think it's because of the coaching that they get. Also, Mikhail made a great decision after the seven-game losing streak to show the guys videos of them when they were performing at peak level, rather than dwelling on their mistakes. That was a great coaching decision, and it was part of what helped this young squad turn, turn things around. Mikhail also has put together the right game plan for this young group, for the most part. But most importantly, Mikhail has the players' trust, and he seems to have an ability to communicate with the players. A coach can have a great plan and all that, but it's all for nothing if he can't gain the trust of the players. Has he made a number of in-game mistakes and rotation mistakes? Sure, but he's also a rookie coach of sorts himself, and he's still learning, and uh, he's been given a very difficult task with this new group of guys coming in and out of the lineup. So I think overall, Mikhail has done a fine job. This video is not to critique Mikhail in general. It's more about exploring the dynamics between Mikhail and Lin and provide my very personal and subjective perspective on the matter. I understand that at the end of the day, no one knows what Mikhail is thinking, but Mikhail. So I'm open to being completely wrong in my interpretations, and at the end of the day, it's all guesswork anyway. So no one can really claim that they're right or another person is wrong in their views on this issue. We can only come up with our interpretations and back them up with reasons that are well thought out. Also, although I'm a Lin fan, I don't speak for all Lin fans, despite what some may think. We Lin fans don't all think alike. Again, I'm just providing my very personal and subjective perspective and hopefully adding some value to the discussion to this matter. Now, on to the video. Throughout the season, there's been a lot of discussion about the whole Mikhail and Lin dynamic within the Linosphere. Yeah, I said Linosphere. In the post-game interview after the Mavs game on March 3rd, Mikhail uncharacteristically talked at length about Lin in glowing terms. But before I get into that, I thought it would be useful to revisit some of the comments Mikhail has made about Lin throughout the season. Some of the videos are very laggy and aren't the best quality, so I apologize in advance for that. What's important to understand about Mikhail is that he's a no-nonsense type of guy. You know the type. They don't get too high or too low about anything and really get irritated by things that get exaggerated or when people make a big deal out of things. Just listen to the way he speaks in post-game interviews. Here's a typical no-nonsense response from Mikhail. Kevin, how far is James away from being you know, a complete part of your offense? About 29 hours. Well, I mean, you're gonna playing to, tomorrow night. But are you going to be able to run everything you want to run with him? About 29 hours. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, of course. I mean, we're gonna. We'll run everything, but I mean, we're gonna run enough. What do you hope to see? What, what I hope to see? Well, yeah. I mean, with, I mean, because a, win, a win. <laughs> Mikhail gets irritated by the media's need to play up situations, so he often downplays things to not make such a big deal out of things. His attitude is, "It is what it is," which is very characteristic of no nonsense types. And you know what irritates no nonsense types the most? All I do is lean, 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 no matter what. Go for MVP, most of proof is not enough. Every time I step up in the garden, everybody's hands go up. Okay, let's get to the sporting goods world, which has been lit on fire since Jeremy Lin, of course, of the New York Knicks, suddenly burst out onto the scene February 4th. Modell Sporting Goods ordered. 170,000 Jeremy Lin items in just 72 hours as soon as Lin Sanity starts. You've got to hear the story. The energy and the feelings yeah. around New York, whether it be in bars or restaurants yeah. or, you know, by the water cooler, everyone's talking about Jeremy Lin. I mean, he's the talk of the nation. Have you ever seen anything like this? Never in my entire life. We've been in business 122 years. This kid, underdog, Two teams didn't want to draft him. No one heard about him 17 days ago. People are throwing their arms up him. Jeremy, marry me. Hype. 
I think Miguel is annoyed by all the Lin sanity hype, and I think that subconsciously feeds into his attitudes towards Lin. He also gets really annoyed sometimes at having to field questions about Lin because he's irritated that the media is still making a big deal out of Lin. Maybe Jeremy Lin struggle for the whole day, but the, in the whole offense, but he doesn't like seem to get involved very much of it. Well, he's got the ball in his hands every time coming down the court. I don't know. That'd be like saying the quarterback's not involved. They hike it to him every play. I don't know what more, what more, what more, what more he can do. He, you know, he has the ball to start off every possession. So That was during the preseason when Lin was struggling offensively, and Lin's teammates often looked him off because he was struggling to score. Lin would pretty much give up the ball when he passed the half court and wouldn't hardly get the ball back after he gave up the ball. So, of course, Mikhail is technically correct in his response that Lin does had the ball to start out with, but Mikhail's offense didn't run screens or anything for Lin and his teammates wouldn't pass him the ball after he gives it up, so the reporter also had a point. Lin really wasn't involved in the offense, but Mikhail responded the way he did because it's the way no-nonsense type person would respond. For example, you have the ball, do something with it, what's the big deal? Mikhail also responded the way he did because he was a little irritated, the media was still fixated on Lin. Months later, in the post-game interview of the Warriors game in which Lin scored 28 and had one of his best offensive games as the Rockets on February 5th, a reporter asked Mikhail a specific question about Lin's performance and Mikhail just flat out didn't answer the question and went on to talk about the team and didn't say anything about Lin. What did you like about how Jeremy attacked Curry tonight? Um, well, the biggest, biggest thing we had, we had night turnovers, which is huge for us. and. Uh, you know, we had 40, uh, we had 35 assists, which was you know, huge for us. So you go 35 and nine, that's a, uh, that, that's fantastic. Um, I just like the fact that we were aggressive. Um, just, you know, <clears throat> got out there and, you know, really started off, like I said, just, just kind of unconscious from the, from the three point line. But then I thought we broke the defense down. I, I you know, we, we we're going to have periods with our team. Um, where shots don't go, but if we keep on having ball movement, body movement, and attacking, getting in the paint, pushing it out, that was fine. Bogus is a, is a good rim protector, and uh, that was one of the better jobs we've, we've done of driving into the paint and kicking it back out, not turning it over, but finding the shot. And then the thing I liked the best about it was we kicked it out, then we had made the extra pass on top of that, which, was, which is what we're trying to get our guys to do. I think that was another indication of Mikhail's annoyance with the media about Lynn. I think Mikhail sometimes takes this annoyance a little too far and this is one of those cases. I think Mikhail's annoyance sometimes carries over to when interviewers ask him questions about Lin even if it has nothing to do with Lin's sanity. I think whatever attention that Lin gets from the media annoys Mikhail. This is why I suspect Mikhail doesn't really mention Lin in his interviews unless he really feels the need to. But Mikhail's no-nonsense attitude and his irritation with the media is also healthy for Lin because he would downplay things and sort of keep a media at bay which tends to want to hype Lin up only to tear him down. For example, in the preseason, he wanted to make sure to let the media know that Lin is still not 100% so they shouldn't blow Lin's preseason struggles out of proportion. Did that open things up for Jeremy a little bit when his passes left? I thought Jeremy was just solid today making the easy play. I think Jeremy pushed, pressed a little bit. You know, and, and he's, you know, he, as much as he tells you guys he's 100% healthy, he's not 100% there yet. But we, we had a long talk just the other day and, um, you know, Go play, I said, you know, play fast, get up and on the floor, attack, be aggressive. If you get too aggressive, believe me, I'll tell you, all right, just, just go. And uh, he was better today. And I, and I said the other thing, don't worry about who you're passing it to. He's kind of saying, well, I'm, he's trying to, can, can we get Kevin shot? The way, the way our offense is set up, the shots are going to flow. Kevin will get shots. But I told Jeremy, just hit the open man. Just drive and hit the first open guy. You see, let him make the next play. And that's what I'm, you know, when we get bad offensively, everybody dribbles the ball once or twice and is, is looking for something specific. Sometimes the best, the best thing you can do is just move and cut and pass and try to create some space for others. This interview during the preseason made me very optimistic about Mikhail being the right coach for Lynn because Mikhail truly encourages a free-flowing offense and when Mikhail told Lin not to worry about making sure that Martin gets his shots, that must have been music to Lin's ears because that's definitely not something Woodson would have said. But of course, all this would change with the arrival of Harden. Now, I'm a big fan of Harden, so I don't mean anything against Harden by that comment. 
It's just that once Harden came onto the team, the Rockets had a number one option. And this heart-to-heart -heart that Mikhail had with Lim that was so encouraging for Lin fans sort of went out the window. But that's a whole other issue and we won't get into that here. Here's another example of how Mikhail's no-nonsense attitude is beneficial towards Lin. Coach, you see a difference in Jeremy Lin now that Harden's here, uh, playing in the backcourt with him, and, as opposed to the preseason. He was a different player. Yeah, you know, but I think his knee is getting better and I think he's starting to feel more... Uh, just, just you know, just comfortable, and I think that you would have said. I thought I really thought that um, the last game in Orlando, even prior to the trade, that we had, you know, he really looked good. He moved the ball, made some shots, and started feeling comfortable. I, you know, I mean, he's really gonna, you know, our our goal in August or October, excuse me, was to use the 28 days for him to get better and healthy. So, um, you know, he did made it through that. And now I think he's starting to. I think he's just getting more comfortable. But everybody, I mean, you know, James draws a lot of attention and um, every, everybody's, everybody's going to benefit from having him on the floor. Reporters love a good story. In this case, they want to say that Harden came in and saved Lin's sanity or something to that effect. And Mikhail, being a no-nonsense type, kept the reporters in check and said that Lin was already coming into form before Harden's arrival, so there's no story here. Let's have a listen to other comments that Mikhail made after the Harden trade about Lynn and the Lynn sanity phenomenon. Just tell Jeremy, you know, <laughs> now some of that pressure's off you. Yeah, and I think that was good for Jeremy, too, yeah. because, you know, I, I always felt with Jeremy, um, it's so hard to live up to, you know, the Lynn sanity hype and yeah. all that. And he just, he's a very good basketball player. He needs to go out there and just be a very good basketball player. James Harden allows him to just be a very good basketball player. Because he's going to take a lot of playmaking off of, off of his plate, but together they can be really good together. So I, I, let me tell you something. When we made that trade, the guy that was most excited when I called up everybody said we were making the trade was Jeremy Lin. He was like, oh, thank goodness, Coach. He goes, you know, so he, 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 I think everybody on our team really respects James and, and they look forward to playing with him. Yeah. So the fact that he was able to survive through the Lin sanity, do you think that helps him grow immediately? as far as handling that spotlight pressure? Probably not. I, mean, I don't know how that helps anybody. I mean, I, I, I think it was exciting. It was, it was a phenomenal story for the league. I mean, it was, it was, it was really cool. I mean, I, I, we're all watching games and stuff like that. But that's like an unrealistic hype mode, whatever you get into. As a player, everybody who's good is going to – you have a ceiling and a floor. You don't play on the ceiling. You surely hope you don't play on the floor. You play somewhere in between there. He had a ceiling moment for about three, four weeks. You don't live on that, but, just to, but to say that – Oh, we expect him to do that every night. That's just that you know that that's unfair. I mean, that's like saying, well, James Harden set his ceiling at 37 points, 12 assists, six rebounds, four steals. If he doesn't do that, he had a bad game. That's silly. I mean, so he just got to come out and be a very good basketball player. I, young players who get a lot of hype at that, I think that actually hurts them more than helps them just in the long run. Because all of a sudden they start thinking, well, if I don't play at that level, I'm not playing well. Well, you're not going to play at that level. I mean, so it just. In the long run, it might be good. I think short-term, it actually hurts guys. The way Mikhail says Lin's sanity shows that he's really irritated by it and belongs in a group of people who think Lin's sanity was way, way, way overhyped. Not just overhyped or simply hyped. But Mikhail's attitude is also healthy and in a way protects Lin from the media scrutiny by telling the media that it's unfair to expect Lin to perform at the Linsanity level every game. So I think Mikhail's no-nonsense attitude helps Lin in this regard by protecting Lin from the media scrutiny. What bothers me about how Mikhail treats Lin and how he talks about Lin is that he seems to disregard everything Lin did during Linsanity. To Mikhail, it's as if Lin has no relation to Linsanity when he says, that's an unrealistic hype mode. Mikhail just sees it as some sort of freak show and Lin was on some sort of freak hype adrenaline thing. Here are some similar comments Mikhail made months later in an interview with Ultimate Rockets on February 12th. One can interpret this as Mikhail once again 
just trying to protect Lin by divorcing Lin's sanity from Lin so that the media wouldn't keep expecting Lin to produce Lin's sanity numbers. But I don't think that's all that's going on here. I think this quote reveals Mikhail's annoyance with Lin's sanity and his strange rationalization that somehow Lin wasn't really responsible for Lin's sanity at all. That it was just some hyped up thing from a major market. This is typical Lin doubter boarding on Lin hater thinking. They tried to take credit away from what Lin actually accomplished on the court by saying it was hyped up by a major media market. I guess we'll never know if it would have been as big if it happened elsewhere and this is exactly the reason why the haters and doubters hang on to this belief because it's a safe position they can take. No one can dispute it unless something like what Lin did, i.e. an unknown Asian American basketball player that went from nearly being cut to putting up numbers that trumped Hall of Famers, coming on to a totally new team without any real practice because he was at the end of the bench etc etc etc. Yeah, like that is going to happen again. So that's something that the haters and doubters can hang on to, to say that it was hyped up because it was in a major market. In this day of Twitter and Facebook, in which news of a high school basketball player's game-winning shot can travel all around the world in a matter of minutes, I find this very hard to believe that insanity would not have happened if it didn't happen in a major media market. That's just being blinded to the realities of today's all-the-time, all-connected world that we live in. Okay, maybe Lin would have had like 10,000 fewer Twitter followers or something like that. But I would bet anything that would have still been Lin's sanity. I mean, Tebow didn't happen in New York. No one ever brings that up. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent because my biggest pet peeve is people who say stuff that sounds good without really thinking about it. But whatever, I guess we'll never know. But the fact that Mikhail hangs on to this idea that Lin's sanity was just some big market hype says a lot about what Mikhail thinks of Lin as a player to me. I mean, I get the things that Mikhail is trying to communicate, and I think part of the things that he is trying to do is to protect Lin from the media. What irritates me about this is that there's no acknowledgement that Lin is being asked to play a new role for Houston, and he doesn't give Lin credit for the fact that Lin is being asked to make a lot of adjustments to his game, and that's a big reason why he's not putting up the numbers. Also, Lin is sharing the ball with essentially a better Jeremy Lin, so that's why his numbers are down, etc. I mean, if Mikhail really was interested in protecting Lin from the media, these are the things he could have mentioned. Instead, he chose to focus on the fact that Lin's sanity was some sort of made-up thing by a major media market and basically divorces Lin from Lin's sanity, like it was some other player who put up those numbers, not the player that he's coaching at the moment. It's also irritating that Mikhail sees Lin as just a typical young player. Don't get me wrong, I do agree that Lin has more to learn. But the way Mikhail talks about Lin disregards everything that Lin accomplished during Lin's sanity. Now in all fairness to Mikhail, he does talk like this about a lot of his players, except Harden, Parsons, and Oshik. But those other young players Mikhail talks to like this haven't done anything close to what Lin did during Lin's sanity and what Lin has done for the Rockets this season. Mikhail talks about Lin as if he's just a typical young player that has so much to learn. Notice how in the interview with Ultimate Rockets, Mikhail didn't hesitate to roll off a laundry list of things that Lin needs to improve on. There's very little respect when Mikhail talks about Lin. There are a lot of theories surrounding Mikhail and Lin. A lot of them I don't buy into, like Mikhail is racist and such, and Mikhail somehow doesn't want Lin to succeed. To me, I don't think it's all that complicated. I just think it comes down to two major things. One, Mikhail is annoyed with Lin's sanity hype. And two, he just sees Lin as a typical young player. Nothing that special and certainly nothing at all remotely connected to Lin's sanity. This is why Mikhail doesn't give Lin the benefit of the doubt and won't hesitate to bench Lin. Unlike Lin fans, Mikhail doesn't think Lin has a very high basketball IQ and he just sees Lin as a typical young player. And because of this, Mikhail fixates on Lin's flaws and overlooks some of Lin's strengths as evidence in the Ultimate Rockets interview when Mikhail didn't hesitate to reel off a laundry list of things for Lin to improve on. There's nothing wrong with this because at the end of the day, it's good to have a coach who is constantly pushing you and I think Lin has the type of personality and character to benefit from this treatment. I just think Mikhail takes it too far sometimes and doesn't recognize a lot of Lin's strengths. 
For example, Mikhail is very glowing of Harden's decision making. He's gonna have the ball in his hands a lot, making a lot of decisions, and um, he, he makes good decisions. So I mean, James is a guy who makes a lot of good decisions. So um, I'm really not really not that concerned about it because if they jump him and and, and, um, and get real aggressive, he makes the right play, and you know he understands the two versus one and the you know the four versus three behind it pretty well, and uh, so he's got a really good feel for the game. You know, Jeremy Lin's gonna. Same thing. Jeremy Lin's gonna have the ball in his hands, and they're, you know, they're, they're jumping up on him, so he's gonna have to make the same decisions. So that's what, it's kind of a little bit what we worked on today. Again, I love Harden, and I think he's a great playmaker and does make great decisions. But I think Lin is actually on par or better than Harden when it comes to decision making. I actually think decision making is one of the things that makes Lin special. I think Harden is a lot more focused on scoring the ball himself than Lin is, as Harden should be. And so Harden would sometimes press a bit much and miss open teammates for easy baskets. Whereas it's rare for Lin to miss an open teammate for easy buckets. Lin is more about finding the optimal scoring opportunity, no matter who it is. And I think Lin does an excellent job of doing this. But I rarely see Mikel give credit for Lin's decision making. In fact, that's one of the things that Mikhail lists in his laundry list of things that Lynn needs to improve on. Mikhail never blames Harden for poor decisions, and that's understandable, but when Lynn messes up, Mikhail can't hide his frustration. Let's take a look at the Portland game on November 3rd and the Spurs game on December 10th. In the Portland game, Lynn made an and one and put the Rockets up by three with less than a minute left to go in the game. Harden inexplicably goes down to double on Aldridge, leaving his man Matthews wide open for a game-tying three. That's the biggest boneheaded decision anyone could make. But Mikhail in his post-game interview just says that Matthews made a big shot. It wasn't like Harden was all over Matthews and he still hit a three. Harden left Matthews wide open because he made a boneheaded defensive error and Mikhail didn't even mention it and essentially covered up Harden's obvious error by saying that it was actually Matthews who made the big shot. That was, you know, Matthews hit a big, a big shot uh, on that one. But again, you know, I, I just think uh, those are the type of things that we're going to you know, have to clean up. and. and then when a reporter asked about Harden flattening everyone out for the last shot in regulation, Mikel was in full support of Harden. It's 16 to tie it at 81. Time running out. Houston's got a shot. Harden's got the ball. In isolation, lacrosse. Oh, like, oh great great good defense. defense by Matthew. Great hands. Those offensive principles that you've been talking about, they apply the same way in the last minute? Do you want this? Because Kind of keep the ball back, or do you want James to kind of take it in his own hands the way you're talking did? about that last shot? The, the last yeah. one, but well, we were not, I just wanted to flatten it out and let James you did. take take that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I thought that well, at that point, I don't mind giving your ball the best, giving the ball to your top scorer and let him flatten uh, something out and, and, yeah, and go to work. And uh, look at James will have the ball in that situation a lot, and he'll deliver a lot. Does. Now I don't have a problem that Mikhail didn't blame Harden for going ISO. The issue I have with it is when Lin did it in the Spurs game, in which Lin had 38 points and was clearly playing out of his mind and hitting every shot imaginable. We're guys who are not accustomed to going one-on-one. -on -one. Well, they have to now. One second left. Jeremy Lin gets Oh, he makes a three. Jeremy Lin as the buzzer went off. The coaches. Back outside to Jeremy Lin, floats it up and in. Another three-pointer for the Rockets. They are red hot. Free throw shooting a lot too over the last couple of years. He used to be a street shooter. Jeremy Lin Jeremy. hits again. On fire. Knocking down some open shots. Jeremy gets around Parker, lays it up and in. Yes. I've seen it a long, long very time. Very patient as well. Nice pass to Greg Smith by Jeremy Lin. Parsons with a re rebound right over Neal. Lin is open. He arcs up yeah. three. Three three-pointers for Jeremy Lin. Became one. That's something you do over time. Find out your weaknesses. You make them your strengths. I'll tell you what. You couldn't tell me that tonight with Jeremy Lin. 
7 0 Houston run. Nine seconds left in the quarter. Rockets can get a basket and take the lead going into the final 12 minutes. Jeremy Lamb puts up yes. the Jeremy Lamb with his fourth three pointer of the game. Wow, what a finish by Houston. The Rockets in the quarter on a 12 3 run. Jeremy Lin with a new season high of 26 points. There'll be another turnover. Jeremy Lin attacking to the basket. Jeremy Lin having his best game as a Houston Rocket. Your key. Uh huh. Lin with the hook shot. He's hitting them from everywhere. Jeremy's got it going. Oh, this looks like. Back in New York. Take your eyes off of it. Lynn. Got it. Oh, Jeremy Lynn. Oh, that caught rain. My question is, why did he stop shooting? Here's where you stay aggressive. Duncan picks him up, so he takes a little tour through the lane. Lynn gives it up to Ashik. Oh! Oh, oh man! man. Ashik with a new career high. Jeremy Lynn says, get out of the middle. I'll take Green by myself. Jeremy Lin, crossover, down to three, down to two. He's gonna have to shoot it. Green shut him out. 24 second violation. Mikhail had the look of death when he started the press conference. Under the circumstances, was Jeremy just feeling it or? Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, what was the question, I'm sorry. Not, you know, uh, under the circumstances, James out and so on, was Jeremy just? Rising to the I, I, yeah, I mean, he played well, you know, he, 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 did, he did a really nice job out there, you know, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I liked him at the end of the game. I wanted him to center the ball more and use the pick. He kind of waved off. Big O was going to go 1-4 flat and we didn't get a shot, but I was kind of hoping Jeremy used the pick. I was calling him up and he waved him off. That's that's two end of game winners where we waved off the play and tried to go 1-4 flat. But I mean, I understand that Lynn isn't the number one option generally for the Rockets. But in this game, on that night, Lin was clearly the number one option. I mean, Mikhail looked completely depressed in the beginning of the post-game interview after the Spurs game. I'm sure he gave Lin a stern talking to because Lin had the look of death in his post-game as well. Of course, it was partly because they lost the game, but Mikhail didn't so much as bat an eye during the Portland post-game when the interview questioned Harden's ISO. And I would argue that Harden's mistakes in the Portland game was way more critical, plus Harden failed in back-to-back -back plays, since Rockets should have won that game, being ahead three with under a minute left. In the Spurs game, it was a game Rockets had no business of winning if it weren't for Lin going insane. Mikhail only gave lip service to Lin's performance in the game, but fixated completely on his one error at the end of the game. What about all the ISOs he did during the game that kept the Rockets in the game? It's almost as if it doesn't matter what Lin does, Mikhail will always doubt Lin's ability. I mean, even on the night that Lin went off and was playing out of his mind, Mikhail still doubted Lin and questioned Lin's decision making. Even though during the insanity, Lin flattened people out and proved that he could hit the clutch shots. In fact, Lin is known for being Mr. Fourth Quarter. There were so many stats during the sanity that supported Lin's clutch abilities, but Mikhail doesn't make the connection because he sees Lin as having no part of Lin's sanity. Mikhail is a through and through Lin doubter, and that's basically all it is in my eyes. Nothing more, nothing less. All this being said, I can understand Mikhail's attitudes towards Lin, and I don't necessarily think it's all that detrimental towards Lin. The harder Mikhail is on Lin, the more Lin will learn, and Lin has the type of attitude and character that will allow him to learn and grow from criticisms. So I don't think Mikhail's criticisms hurt Lin for the most part. The short term might not look pretty at times, but in the long run, I think Lin will benefit from having to play a new role and having a coach who's tough on him and is constantly pushing him. Although I think Mikhail does go overboard, and it does cause Lin to play on eggshells sometimes. And that's when it's unhealthy, because Lin is having to constantly worry about making mistakes, and he ends up playing not to lose rather than playing to win. I think that was definitely the case early in the season, but as Lin gained more confidence, it became less of an issue. I did see it coming back again, however, during that Clippers game before the All-Star break. 
I think Mikel's over-the-top reaction to Lin's turnover late in the game really made Lin feel like he has to play on eggshells again. But I think the All-Star break really helped to cool things off in that respect. So I'm fine with Mikel doubting Lin and being hard on Lin. What is most concerning about Mikel as it relates to Lin is that Mikel really doesn't like point guards to dribble too much. I couldn't figure out why Mikel took Lin out so early in the Denver game in the first quarter in which I still feel was Lin's best ball handling game. Lin got subbed out with like 6 minutes left to go in the first quarter which is a lot earlier than he usually gets subbed out. It didn't make sense to me at the time because Lin was playing more aggressively than I had seen Lin play all season and handling the ball better than I'd ever seen him handle the ball. Mikhail also sat Lin out with 7 minutes left to play in the third quarter and didn't bring Lin back until less than 10 minutes left to play in the game. This is one of the few games that Lin actually outscored Harden, yet Lin only played 31 minutes in the game and Harden played 41 minutes. Free throw line early on. Jeremy Lin much more aggressive tonight. And a sweet dish to Greg Smith. Look at Smash breaking nicely tonight here in the first half. Lin drops it home. He had another one of those big Gallo nights against Andy. I said, I don't think you're allowed to go back home as Osik finishes up. Delmar, four of eight, just one of three from the three point line, but he was open. Yeah, he's been shooting well lately. Oh, low ball into Kufus. Didn't they, wasn't able to hold him. There's that penetration again. And Osik dunks it in. Nuggets have done a good job in that category. Lynn, wide open. Jeremy Lin active. And Delfino lights up a three ball. Last four shots. Nuggets lead by eight. Lin wide open. But I realize now that what I saw is Lin's incredible ball handling skills. Mikel saw as Lin over dribbling. In that Denver game, Lin kept penetrating the lane on every possession and kept his dribble alive if he wasn't successful in the first attempt to penetrate the lane and Lin had the patience to wait for the play to develop. I thought that demonstrated mature point guard skills, but Mikhail doesn't like his point guards to dribble too much. He prefers his point guards to just keep the ball moving, mostly by passing. He wants his point guard, and everyone on the team for that matter, to get rid of the ball quickly and keep it moving side to side and in and out. Now, I don't have a problem with this philosophy. In fact, it's one of the things that I do like about Mikhail's coaching. He really emphasizes ball movement and player movement. I think that's all great and I do think it helps Lin's game to learn this skill to make quick decisions and move the ball. But I think Mikhail should allow Lin the freedom to hang on to the ball a little more than he would allow other players because Lin's after all the floor general. I'd hate for Lin's ball handling to suffer because of a coach that would bench him every time he keeps his dribble alive by penetrating the lane and coming back out to reset and find another play. That would hurt Lin's development as a point guard. I'm not saying Lin should hang on to the ball all the time or even most of the time. I'm just saying that Mikel needs to allow Lin the freedom to do it every now and then because Lin has the skills to keep his dribble alive and wait for the right play to develop. This is something that Chris Paul is a master at. I'd rather have my point guard hang on to the ball even if the ball gets sticky at times than for him to pass it to some other guy who has to find the right play. But Mikhail has absolutely no patience for this, and I think that's a huge mistake. He'd rather have Lin immediately give up the ball right when Lin crosses the half court just so the ball is moved than for Lin to hang onto the ball a little bit and see what play develops before Lin gives up the ball. Mikhail just wants his point guard to either play downhill and attempt to score right away or immediately give up the ball. He has no patience for Lin to penetrate the defense and then keep his dribble alive and try and find the right play after an unsuccessful attempt to penetrate the defense. But I told Jeremy, just hit the open man. Just drive and hit the first open guy. You see, let him make the next play. And that's what I'm, you know, when we get bad offensively, everybody dribbles the ball once or twice and is, is looking for something specific. Sometimes the best, the best thing you can do is just move and cut and pass and try to create some space for others. This is what concerns me most about Mikel's relationship with Lin because I think it will hurt Lin's development. So I'm fine with pretty much everything about the mcphail lin dynamic except this one. The way I see it, it's only a matter of time until Mikel gains more confidence in Lin. So I'm not that worried about how Mikel treats Lin like a child now. It's annoying, sure, but it'll just take time. 
Mikhail's intolerance for a point guard to hang onto the ball, on the other hand, is something that will never change. And so that's why I'm most concerned about it. It's just what Mikhail believes is the right way to play. And the thing is, Mikhail is very valid in feeling this way because I also think it's the right way to play. But where I differ from Mikhail is that I think a point guard should have some free reign to hang onto the ball in certain instances and wait for the play to develop. But Mikhail is absolute in his belief that the ball should never be sticky. And that's where I think Mikhail is wrong. And that's where he's really hurting Lin's game. And based on an interview back in November, it seems as if Maury feels the way I do. But I'm not sure if Maury still feels the same way today. But is there one thing that you might see that you think has your stamp on it that just appeals personally to you that the rest of us might just watch and, and let it go by? Yeah, I think we, we really like guys who, uh, who can attack the hoop. Um, our point guard, obviously Jeremy Lin's a great example of that, James Harden. You know, point guards who are a little more traditional, a little more safe, a little more just move the ball, uh, stay within their lane. Uh, I don't think they impact winning as much as people think. I like, I like having multiple attack guards uh, and playing with pace. The way I see it, Mikhail wants a move the ball type point guard. Maury recognizes Lynn isn't a move the ball type point guard. Lynn is an attack point guard. After the Brooklyn game, Mikhail made a comment that got published in the Daily News that I think refers to this move the ball versus attack point guard. Before this quote even came out, I speculated in my blog that I think Mikhail is sometimes irritated by Lin because he thinks Lin is just a typical young player who's more concerned about padding Lin's stats than playing the right way. One of the reasons I thought this is because whenever Mikhail talks about Delfino, he always feels the need to say that Delfino just plays the right way, he's not concerned about his stats, etc. And he says that a lot of young players are still worried about their stats and such. And I think when Mikkel says this, it's a little dig at Lin, since Mikkel sees Lin as a typical young player, as evidenced in the quotes I've already shown you. It was sort of a leap to make on my part, but then this quote came out from the Daily News, which I think confirms my suspicion. I wouldn't be surprised if this quote was taken out of context or something, and is meant to stir up controversy. Even so... I think I know why Mikhail said what he said about Lin. And I think it's due to a misunderstanding and also due to Mikhail not giving Lin the benefit of the doubt. Let me explain. Lin has been forced to change his game in Houston, which I don't think is a bad thing, by the way, to be a point guard who plays off the ball and makes the quote-unquote easy play. In other words, a move-the-ball type point guard. Lin is an attack point guard, who is doing his best to fit into Mikhail's mind of what a point guard should be. But of course, you can't change your game completely and irrevocably overnight. So every now and then, Lin reverts back to being an attack point guard a la Lin Sanity, who may hang onto the ball and keep his dribble alive a little more than Mikhail is comfortable with, such as in the Denver game as I discussed earlier. This is why Mikhail uses the word sometimes because it's only sometimes that Lin would relapse into Linsanity mode. And whenever Lin does this, Mikhail mistakenly thinks that Lin is purposefully ignoring Mikhail just to pad Lin's stats, trying to live up to Lin's sanity. This is the extent to which Mikhail really doesn't understand Lin or Lin's game. And this is where I think that quote is coming from. Now, we finally get to the post-game interview I referenced at the beginning of this video. The most recent one against the Dallas Mavericks on March 3rd. You mentioned uh, Jeremy. Is that about as well as you've seen him play all year? Well, you know, Jeremy, yeah, I mean, Jeremy's had a lot of good games for us. And, I mean, that, 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 that's the high end. But, I mean, any time you have you know, 8 for 14, 21 points, 9 assists, 2 turnovers, that's high end for everybody. I mean, it's high end for Chris Paul. So, um, you know, he played well, but he's had a lot of games where he's had, had real high-end games and stuff. And, and uh, you know, I, I think just like, like all, all of our young guys, I, you know, <clears throat> as you get older, you just get more consistent. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to have 21 and 9 all the time, but you, 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 find, your, you find your level. Then you just kind of go out there and you, and you maintain a consistency. But Jeremy, Jeremy's more than 
Yeah, you know, I, I think what Jeremy proved last year <clears throat> is that his high-end ceiling, he can get on a roll and, and sustain it for a while. And we're going to need him to. I mean, we have, what, 21 games left. And, you know, I mean, it, I, as I said, you know, win, lose, or draw tonight. We play these guys again Wednesday. We have a three-game road trip. We come off this three-game road trip, and we have a real long homestead where we got to you know, make some hay. But we got to go on the road and try to win a few games. And, uh, you know, so we're going to need him playing at, at a high end. And, and you know, he didn't play, the, and that's the thing I like about Jeremy, he didn't play the fourth quarter of the last game um, in Orlando because Patrick played so well and he was excited on the bench. He's just a good teammate. Okay. This is the lengthiest positive comments I've heard from Mikhail on Lynn. It was one of the rare times I heard Mikhail actually respecting Lynn's game. I think a lot of his comments had to do with atoning for the Daily News quote. It becomes abundantly clear when he makes sure to talk about Lynn being a good teammate at the end of the interview. The question is whether or not he did it out of his own accord or if it was prodding from Les due to some sort of fallout from the Daily News article. It could be just that Mikhail felt that the quote was taken out of context or something or he didn't mean to say it like that or something and was just trying to rectify his mistake. The thing about Mikhail is that he's a genuine person. So I think he does mean these compliments that he gave Lynn. And I think maybe the fallout from the Daily News article made him realize that he hadn't given Lynn due props for good games that Lynn has had in the past. That's why he stressed that Lynn's had a lot of nice games for us. Hopefully there's a new chapter for Mikhail and Lynn. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. What I'll be looking to see is if Mikhail gives Lynn the freedom to dribble the ball more than the other players at times when Lynn feels the need to do so. That's what's critical to me because Lynn needs a coach who will give him the freedom to keep his dribble alive and wait for the play to develop at times, rather than just always moving the ball all the time. Lynn is an attack point guard. He's not a move the ball point guard. I just want Mikhail to give Lynn the freedom to be the attack point guard at times. I'm all for ball movement. But the point guard should be given free reign to determine times when he needs to hold on to the ball a little bit longer to wait for the play to develop. If Mikhail wants Lin to play at a high level, then he should allow Lin to play the way Lin knows how to play at times, rather than just be a move the ball point guard all the time. That's what's important to me. So we'll see if this happens or not going forward. Thanks for listening. I know this was a very long video. Please give me constructive comments below and subscribe if you're interested in hearing more of this type of analysis. Also, give me a thumbs up or thumbs down.